there is certainly a spiritual application in holding to God's unchanging hand, for it is a spiritual song. But there's been times in the last couple of weeks when I'd be willing to hold on to anything just to keep from spinning off into outer space with vertigo. And maybe there's a lesson in that 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 might teach us by holding to God through obedience to the gospel, we are stabilized. And we're not moved with every wind of doctrine and slight of men whereby they in cunning craftiness lie in wait to deceive us. And of course, all day long every day, we have in mind the COVID virus 19 business, whatever you think about it. And the emergence of that has changed our world in a number of ways. I went back to read some in history of the Black Death, which first appeared in Europe in the 1300s. And uh, the first round is when it killed into the millions. But it continued to make its appearance for about 300 years. It just was not all over the place, but tended to have hot spots, such as in London and other places. So they had to contend with that for a long time, as well as many other things that came upon those folks at a time when ignorance in the matter of medicine was around. And you don't have to go back 150 years in America to where people didn't know what a germ was. And you don't have to go back to just World War II to where there was the first antibiotic, penicillin. Sometimes we have become so used to things, they're so commonplace, we get the idea, well, it's always been this way, and it's never going to change. Though hard to believe, Wearing masks, standing in line to end the grocery store, etc., and early on uh, the disappearance of toilet paper and the selling of it at a premium became a, a part of daily American life. And part of that activity has been the great change of practicing social distancing. I found it highly interesting the last several days as things are opening up again that people want it to be the way it was so badly they just ignore all of this. Health officials, though, tell us that we can prevent contracting and spreading the virus by maintaining a distance of some six feet from each other, <clears throat> refraining from hugging and shaking hands and picking our nose and then shaking hands or whatever else goes on. It may come as a surprise to you, but between Bible class and worship for a long, long time, I've washed my hands. I've watched too many brethren snort and blow all over their hand and say, good morning, Brother Brown, how do you do? Well, may we be reminded that a great many problems that have gone on regarding spread of disease was didn't change when this thing came along. And I'm amazed sometimes that people will say, well, we have this killing so many people and that killing so many people. Why are we so concerned now? What kind of logic is that? If we would practice good hygiene and being careful, maybe many of those wouldn't be sick. And you just think of what you do with your own life and dealing with your own family members. So we can do things to stop doing, spreading some of these things. Now this all has to do with bodily health, physical health. Well, I want to make a spiritual lesson out of this. And I try to do that with everything I see because I see the inspiration of the Old Testament takes fleshly Israel and then those things are written before time for our learning, who are spiritual Israel under the authority of Christ in the New Testament, the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. This practice of good health, that is social distancing, 
bears a striking parallel to our spiritual health. We're commanded to be thou faithful. Let's be spiritual. You could have said be thou spiritual and said the same thing. Be thou faithful unto death and you'll receive the crown of life. Revelation 2.10. Notice what I mean about how this bears social distancing. A striking resemblance to spiritual living. Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 22. Abstain. Now think about the meaning of abstain. Abstain from the very appearance of evil. Literally abstain from every form of evil. Evil is anything contrary to the Lord's will. Evil is any sin. Evil, remember in the model prayer, deliver us from temptation. He didn't say deliver us from transgressing God's law because he knows the process of getting to the point of transgressing God's law. Temptation. James deals with that. When he talks to Christians saying, let no man say when he's tempted, solicited to violate God's will, that it's from God. For God doesn't do that to any man. Well, then how does it happen? We're all drawn away after our own lust. Go back to the Garden of Eden. One commandment. You can eat of all the trees of the garden but one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. I've often thought about this. Why couldn't he be said, thou shalt die? Why did he add, thou shalt surely die? To give emphasis. It's going to happen. Nothing you do about it. You violate this separation from me immediately, and thus physical death begins. What did that do for Eve? She still leaned heavily upon the appetites of the flesh. That's the way the devil appealed to her. And she took of the fruit and ate it. And Adam just went into it eyes wide open. She gave it to Adam. He ate it. Then sin in the world. All Eve had to do was abstain from the very appearance of every form of evil. That's all she had to do. I've often wondered, why was she up there in the first place? Listening and talking. If she had practiced this business of maintaining her distance, that wouldn't happen. The word abstain means to avoid. To avoid. You know another way you say that? Keep your distance. Now, John's a law enforcement officer. You can watch on television and see this. But especially in the news are some of these actual reality shows of cops doing things. And when they get somebody at gunpoint, they want them to stay a certain distance. They usually want them to get on the ground face down and such things as that. And you've seen them where they would have them turn around, hands in the air, and you walk back to me because they want to keep control. Well, it's interesting we can see these things in the physical matter, and even then so many won't pay any attention to it. So why should we really expect it to be paid much attention to in the church? Remember, most of the New Testament was written to those who heard, believed, and from the heart obeyed the gospel. The Lord added them to the church. The rest of it is teaching us how to deal with Satan so that he will not get us back into his fold. This passage... That is 1 Thessalonians 5.22. Is found in a context. That's the environment in which it's found. Abstain from the very appearance of evil. Whenever evil appears, get away from it. It's found in a context dealing with and teaching. He'll say, don't quench the spirit. You know, when you quench a fire, it's dead out. Like Smokey the Bear used to say, it can't start back. And he says, do not despise prophecies, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 19 and 20. Of course, that was said in the miraculous age of the church. And lest we forget, those miraculous gifts could be used properly or they could be misused. Just read 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14 to see where they'd been being misused and took a Holy Spirit-inspired letter to the church at Corinth to show 
how to use them, to correct them, to show their abuses of them, their own wrong attitude toward them. So when he says these things, he's talking about plainly those things in the first century. But the principle yet remains and will to the end of time. The inspired instruction was not to reject the prophet or the fourth teller. That's literally what it means. The New Testament prophet was, without the New Testament written down, the teacher of the truth to the congregation. Don't despise it. Let me ask you this. How would you despise a teacher of God's word? What would you have to do on your part, or not do, the case may be, to despise it? Even a person with a miraculous gift of prophecy who had an apostle's hands laid on. Well, you would simply ignore what they're saying. You would not take into consideration, well, how could they do that in the age of miracles? They killed Christ in the age of miracles. And everything he did was in complete harmony with God. And all the miracles he worked says, I am the Messiah, the Son of God, the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. He even made comments, and that was John 14, 6. John 8, 24, except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Now what did that do for Annas and Caiaphas? Nothing. They despised those comments. So here's a letter to members of the church. Remember, they are Christians. In the miraculous age, when they didn't have a written down, completed New Testament, how then were they to live like God wanted them to through the work of these miraculous gifts, all nine listed, 1 Corinthians 12. That's how they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine, Acts 2.42. So don't despise God's fourth teller. This is coming from God. So what does he say? Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. That's in verse 21 of 1 Thessalonians. Right in this context, same one that says abstain from the very appearance of evil or every form of evil or whenever you see evil. Well, of course, you have to know what the truth is so you can recognize what's contrary to it, which would be evil. This is my responsibility as a Christian. It's your responsibility as a Christian. One who passed the tests to be embraced but one who failed and was proven to be false was to be rejected. The church was to abstain from every form or every appearance of evil. That statement is not hard to read. It is a direct statement telling people how to conduct themselves. Spiritually, distance yourself from all evil as it appears. That's simple. That's what he's saying. That's part of being faithful to God. It's how you're steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor, part of it's abstaining from every appearance of evil, is not in vain in the Lord. Of course, we know spiritual gifts are no longer available. But the truth given as they were applied, as it was applied to those spiritual gifts and their use of 1 Thessalonians 5.22 is just as applicable. After all, think for a moment. The whole Bible, I speak primarily here of the New Testament since we're talking about Christian living. The whole New Testament was given in the miraculous age. It is the product of supernatural intervention by revelation and miracle signs and wonders done by the people who received it to prove it was from heaven, not from man. Those things are long gone as far as the miracles are concerned. But the truth of spiritual distancing, if you would be faithful and go to heaven, is binding as it can be and will be at the end of time. And that verse, abstain from every appearance of evil, will be right there to judge us on the last day. It's part of the standard of judgment that will be used. So whether it's false doctrine, whatever form that takes, or whether it's Temptation from the devil as he through the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, combination of them, solicits us to gratify them by breaking God's will, immorality, false religious systems, whatever it may be.
Christians must practice consistently and steadfastly spiritual distancing. Too often it seems we try to get as close to sin as possible without touching it. But the writer of Proverbs said in Proverbs 6.27, Can a man take fire into his bosom and not be burned? What is the point? You know, we say nowadays the way we would say, you play with fire, you get burned. If you play with it long enough. Well, that's the idea. If you don't believe in abstaining from every form or the very appearance of evil, expect to get burned spiritually. Drawing near to God, loving His truth, sacrificing anything that keeps us from doing it, being willing to repent of our sins, to turn away from it and turn to those things pertaining to godliness, looking to the day we go into eternity will make a difference to our choices because we're to draw near to Him, not abstain from Him through knowledge and practice of the truth. That, to use a term in the computers, by default, will push us further away from wickedness. Well, social distancing will stop eventually to some extent or the other. We think it will. I find out also reading about the Black Death, there are things still unfold today that because that thing was such a tragedy, in fact, that the whole world, it started then, and yet some of those things still work today. Are there being, a, they're just a part of things. I remember a while ago I was thinking as this lesson was going to be preached, I didn't know this, nobody else did. Talking about get back to normal. What in the world's normal? <laughs> get back to normal. Life is a constant changing thing. And the last thing that changes is that radical transition from physical things to eternity. I know what we mean, and I agree with it, certainly, when they get back to normal. Usually normal means my rut that I'm used to. <laughs> That's what it means. Me, I don't, I don't like to have changes in my ordinary way of doing things. But when you think about becoming a Christian, that is a radical change. Conversion, that's a radical change. So, sin distancing must be a permanent fixture. Now that's the first part, because here's what we usually think. If you want to outline this, that's my first main point. Here's the second one and the last one. Don't sample sin. We've all gone to grocery stores, supermarkets, Sam's or somewhere like that. And on certain days they've got all these little ladies out there and they've got their little carts and they're trying to push product. That's their job. And they don't ask you to buy the whole thing. They'll mention it. Where is it in the display case? They'll say it's right here. But what are they offering you? Use this little cup about like that with some little something in it. Try this. And you try it. I've heard of some students very poor in college. The way they helped feed themselves was to know when all these samples were being up, given and they would go around and eat all the samples they could. And that's the way when they didn't have money to buy groceries, that's the way they had their meal. The point is, that's a source of enticement to get you to buy the whole thing. That's all Satan wants us to do. He's inviting, inviting those reluctant to yield to temptation by merely taking a sample. In other words, I'm not asking you to be a full-time, wholehearted, convicted servant of mine. Just see what it's like. Just dabble little fling. Of course, then you can repent and return to the Lord's way. Now, does that sound like what we've been discussing in the first part of the sermon? It doesn't. Of course, the, for us, the clear, because the devil is always going to do that with us, the clear response is, don't do it. Don't do it. And here's why. Don't sample sin because the time you assume you have 
to engage in it and then later correct it is not guaranteed. One's physical death is often a surprise. Certainly the Lord's final return is known by no, no mortal. And he tells them nobody's going to know. In either case, our lives on earth will be over. Our physical existence will have ceased. The appetites of the flesh will be gone. Our time of probation is over. Our time of proving to God we love Him with all that we are and that we have faith in His system is finished. Oh, it'll be ready or not, here I come. If you remember playing hide and seek. And then comes the judgment and eternity in heaven or hell according to the way we lived on this earth, Hebrews 9, 27. Mark 13, verse 32 John 12, 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. And then the parable Jesus gave, forecasting the judgment, Matthew 25. There's one reason. Don't sample sin because of the time you assume to have to engage in it and to correct your life. You just don't know when that's going to end. Um, there's a denominational preacher who was known for his great work in apologetics. He's my age, maybe March, I think, to December, older than I am. Ravi Zacharias of Indian, in India, derivation, but he was very young and he came over here. Except for looking ethnically Indian, he sounded like any one of us. And he was speaking this past January, as lively as he could be, doing a very good job in apologetics. He knows nothing or knew nothing of New Testament Christianity, plan of salvation. But in matters of the existence of God, the inspiration of the Bible, the deity of Christ, he was tremendous. Well, just two months later in March, he was diagnosed with a very rare spinal cancer, and he died about a week ago. You don't know. With some of us, it may be a car wreck on the way home today. With other of us, it may be just a gradual decline. The point is you don't know. Now, when you don't know, what is the rule of thumb? Take the safe way. The next one is don't sample sin because your current inclination to later correct that sin may even change. We don't allow for our change of viewpoints and attitudes in the future. But if we engage and dabble in sin, that could very well be the thing that changes our attitude in the future toward the sins that we thought we would give up. And we don't care much about it anymore. It doesn't seem very much of a problem. Because sin has a hardening effect on the inward man of the heart and can result in a seared conscience. So that the gospel call or the teaching of how to live the Christian life, such as abstain from the very appearance of evil, just doesn't make any difference anymore. Hebrews 3.13, Luke 8.12, and 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. The next one is, don't sample sin because even forgiven sin, yes, your sin's forgiven, may have unrelenting, sorrow-laden consequences. David said, as a saved man, my sins are ever before me. Because as we sow, so shall we reap, Paul says in Galatians 6, 7, and 8. You think of, I'll use an immoral activity. You think of those with HIV developing into AIDS because of immoral and unnatural immorality. Well, yes, they can hear the gospel and hopefully they will obey the truth. But they've got to contend with the consequences of their sin as long as they're alive on this earth. It probably will cut their life short from a normal. They'll have all that impact on their own loved ones. Now, just think of the things. You just don't sin and stay to yourself. It always impacts somebody else. And many times, those you love the most. Galatians 6, 7 through 8. And the last point, don't sample sin 
because of unwanted memories that will be acquired and you can't get rid of them. Forgiven, yes. Having turned from that practiced way of habitually sinning, yes. But you can't get rid of your memories. You can know God holds them against you anymore. He doesn't hold them against you anymore. Because you obeyed the gospel in full faith and obedience to it, your sins are remitted. Or as a Christian, if you went off into sin and apostatized and repented. But the thing about it is, those memories are still there. And they can become a shame and a regret. Psalm 119, verse 104. David said plainly, through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. So how foolish to agree to do that which provides fleeting pleasure, but is followed by an abiding, haunting regret. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25. The harm done to others by our sins, though we have repented and are forgiven, can still trouble us all the days of our life. 1 Timothy 1, verse 15. That's one reason you have the statement to young people, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, the days draw nigh. Thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in you. Because when you begin with good habits based upon honest action of doing the truth and you form your life around those things as early as possible, then you don't allow bad things to become habitual to you. It makes it much harder to turn away from them and stay with the truth. So there's a spiritual application of this COVID virus business. Social distancing, spiritual distancing, abstain from every appearance or every form of evil. And then there's what the devil's going to tell you. Oh, that's, that's not that big a deal. Just try it a little bit. Just sample it. And then we're hooked. If you're not a Christian today, there's but one way to become one. There are not many ways, like the world around about us tells us. As, as there is one God, there is one Savior, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. There is one Bible that declares we have salvation. And there's one gospel that is God's way to save man. Because it's the power that he has ordained to save us from sin. We have this life to show God we choose him over anything else. And when in doubt... We don't. Because we're to act only as we're authorized to act. Colossians 3.17. That means we're walking by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5.7. Well, if you don't know for sure, leave it alone. Abstain from every appearance of evil. That means you've got to know the book so that you'll know what evil is and what is not. If not, you'll be like the people of old. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. If you need to become a Christian, you must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That is an absolute must. You must repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized for the remission of your sins by His authority. There is no other way to become a Christian. You can't just do one of those to the exclusion of the others and God's happy with it. To be obedient to the complete plan of salvation means the right attitude toward God and His Word and compliance with each step in the plan of salvation until you're baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. As a child of God, repentance demands a breaking down of our old stubborn will, the seed of all sin and resistance against God, rebellion against Him, saying, yes, I've sinned. Yes, I've gone back into the world. Yes, I've sampled sin. Yes, I have not practiced spiritual distancing. And repenting of those things, whatever form they take, and asking God for forgiveness. I'm glad to announce at the end of every sermon, God stands ready to forgive. God wants to forgive. He's done everything possible so that a free moral agent can be forgiven. But he says, choose you this day whom you will serve. And you must make the choice. I must make the choice.
So if you're subject to the invitation of Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.